All right, I'm here with Matt Gaspers, and we're talking about the Synod on Synodality and how Pope Francis is using it as a perpetual Vatican II. We've got the quotes, we've got the examples. We're going to be talking about even how DJ Priest, remember him, how he's involved in the Synod, and where things are going from here. Matt Gasper, what should we begin with? Should we begin with some of these graphics, like the Sesame Street stuff? Yeah, it is the, <laughs> you know, I had, so when, when Francis in mid-October announced that he was extending this thing for another year, it was supposed to conclude with the meeting of the bishops in Rome in October 2023, but now there's going to be a meeting in October 23, and then another one in, in October 24. As we've discussed on your show before, it's they make it look like a Sesame Street uh, show like a brought to you by Crayola or something, you know, with the crayon drawings. So I had an idea come to mind for a meme. The Count from uh, from Sesame Street likes to say, you know, one thing, two thing, three things, ah, ah, ah. So it's <laughs> one year, two years, three years of synod, ah, ah, ah. Yeah, because we, uh, there he is right there on the screen, because it's been extended <laughs> to a third year. And that's that's part of what we're going to talk about is that this thing is never going to end because it is their form of controlled chaos. Or in the, in the words of Archbishop Vigano recently, he referred to it as perpetual revolution. I think that's a very Perfect. accurate way of describing, Perfect. summing it up. All right, well, let's let's pray. Let's do the Our Father. Let's pray the Pater Noster. And then we'll, we have a great clip um, from... One with Diane Montagna, one with Ed Penton, and we got some great graphics. And Matt Gasper's done a lot of research, and uh, you're going to get a lot of info on what's going on in Rome, your latest update of what's going on in the Vatican. But before that, let's pray for Holy Mother Church, and we'll pray the Our Father together. Oremus. Nomine Patris et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Pater Noster, qui es in Celi, Sanctificetur Nomen Tuum, Adveni Regnum Tuum. Fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cielo et in terra. Lem nostrum quotidianum de nobis hodie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. 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 Nomine Patris et Fidi, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. And just a reminder, while we get started here, please go ahead and subscribe and hit the like button and all those things. And um, all right, let's do it. Should we start with the video clips? Yeah, or, or if you want, I can kind of give a brief uh, explanation yes. of what this, what the doc, the new document, the latest document out is called the the working document on the continental stage. I think you might have a graphic which shows uh, kind yeah. of the timeline of this debacle. Now, this is from the late. This is published in the new working document at the Synodal Process 2021 through 2024. There it is. So, once you're okay, great. So, as folks can see on the screen, uh, stage one has already happened local consultation, as has, um, well, I guess now we're going into stage two. So, stage one was all about local consultation, the so called diocesan phase that we discussed the last time we talked about this, where beginning at the parish level, having the listening sessions and the surveys, even with people who aren't even Catholic involved in this, as we discussed. And then all that information got uh, filtered up to the diocesan offices. They had to put together uh, summaries, syntheses of what they received, and then forward that on to the USCCB, who then had to compile a national synthesis, which came out in, I think it was like mid to late September. It's called the U.S. National Synthesis, and this was happening all over the world, uh, dioceses, bishops' conferences all over the world. So now we're, we've entered into what they're calling the continental stage of this thing, where— you, Is there uh, a continental like con breakfast involved at, at all in this? Oh <laughs> uh, No, I don't know. Knowing the bishops, they'll probably have, uh, put it a little bit higher than the continental stage. They'll have uh, their apple teenies and, apple and all teenies, that good stuff. Yeah. Apple teenies <laughs> and apple waffles. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so uh, we're in stage three, or we're moving into stage three. I think we are. We will be in 
stage two until March of next year. And then they have to all the this the continental meetings, which is going to include again the it's, the working document specifically says that you know Catholics who rarely practice the faith, people who aren't even Catholic, need to be included in these meetings, and the bishops basically just need to rubber stamp whatever the assembly comes up with, and then they forward that on to the Vatican, and then they have to come up with the official instrumentum laboris for the meeting of the bishops. Uh, the working document for the meeting of bishops in Rome in October 2023. And, you know, we can only imagine what's going to be included in that document. It's just going to keep getting worse and worse. So the idea is Uh, we consult not just lay people, but non-Catholics. Right. What do you think the Catholic Church should be? Blah, 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 blah. Then we spend a lot of time and money, pew dollars, your money out there, And then we write documents that go to the USCCB, which is a total joke and a waste of money and should be disbanded yesterday. And then they are now moving into a continental USCCU or conference. I mean, what is this? Is this going to turn into continental bishops conferences? It's a good question. I, I have never heard of this being part of a synodal process. I mean, usually it's just the bishops meet gather in Rome. It's not this worldwide consultation of the people of God, which they think they need to do. And also, everyone needs to understand, and Matt and I have talked about it before, before Vatican II, we talked about the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. That was it. There was the church, capital T, capital C. It wasn't the Protestants. It wasn't the Lutherans. It wasn't the Methodists. Since Vatican II, there is the new idea of people of God. And people of God is this generic, ghostly uh, arrangement of everyone who has good will. So when you it's the concentric circles that Paul the six mentioned, you got the 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 church herself is the smallest circle. Then you widen it to include the Orthodox, then the Protestants, then non Christians, yeah, yeah, and then yeah, spiritual people, and then. You know, and even atheists, atheists who help old ladies cross the street there and there. And that's called the people of God. And that's Vatican II, everything is about not just the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, but this, this idea of the people of God. And that's why, because the people of God are basically, the Pope is the Pope of the people of God. That's how he sees himself. And he's not talking about just the church. He's talking about people of goodwill. That's why all the people of God, like Muslims, Lutherans, etc., they're allowed to come and give input on the Synod on Synodality. And as a result of that, during the diocese, so-called diocesan phase, what they've produced at the at the rev- level of Rome now, the Synod of Bishops in Rome, is a 49-page document that was released, presented to the world on October 27th during a Vatican press conference. As you said, we have some video clips to show. And this document consists of four chapters and centers around a theme drawn from Scripture. The, I think you might have the, the, cover, Im- the cover of this document. The, it has on it, enlarge the space of your tent with all their nice Crayola drawings. The on has the, yeah, is this the yellow highlight? Uh, that's It's the other one. It's the the cover of the book and it says on so i just read i can't find it yeah that's fine um so the scripture that they've chosen to use as the theme for this document is from the book of isaiah chapter 54 verse 2 enlarge the space of your tent and the document says elsewhere this image and narrative represents a key to an interpretation of the contents within the working document in light of the word, placing them in the ark of God's promise that becomes a vocation for his people and his church. Okay, so right there. His is, people and his yeah. church. Yeah, same this thing. This is all gobbly right? duke. <laughs> yes. Go read yes. Pius X, clear, you understand what he's talking about, and then you read this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the ark of God's promise that becomes a vocation for his people and his church. I'm not even sure it's, what that it's means. It's like they have a a drawer full of 50 hot words like vocation and yep. uh, uh, 
Eucharistic assembly and Paschal mystery. And I think I did a video a long time ago where we went through all these hot words. And what they do is they just reach into the drawer and then they add other grammatical words and they create yep. these sermons and documents using all the same words, but it doesn't mean anything. That, that jogged my memory actually on Twitter. Uh, Carl E. Olson, who is the, I think he's the editor of Catholic World Report. He tweeted out shortly, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, some word counts from working document for synod. So synod, the words synod and synodality occur in this document 147 times, experience 62 times, listen or listening 51 times. Then we skip down to actual Catholic language. Jesus or Christ is mentioned 15 times right. as opposed to synod, synodality 147. Holy Spirit is listed 11 times. Worship, zero. Right. Virtue, zero. Holiness, zero. <laughs> uh, it's, Quite tell. Okay, I'm going to give a Novus Ordo sermon right now or document. Are you ready? Just on the fly. I wasn't planning on this. Brothers and sisters, thank you for entering into our Eucharistic ministry as we assemble together as a community face to face to listen to one another, to enter deeply into the heart of the other to experience, even to accompany those who are marginalized and who are in need of a direct encounter with the divine transcendent. So now let us turn to one another and give each other the embrace, the embrace of the Christ figure in our midst to encounter the spiritual presence of what it means to be living our baptismal identity within the mystery of the Paschal celebration that we are all experiencing today in the midst of the look and the gaze of the Father, perceiving the community that we share with one another. Did I nail it? Oh yeah, 100%. I could go on 100%. and on, because it's just the same 50 words. They just yep. got to, it's like Tetris. You just got to keep fitting them together. And it, <laughs> everything I just said meant absolutely nothing. Yep. It's, a, it's a joke. Yep. I should have done it yep. in the Jesuit list, but I just didn't know if I could keep it that long. All right. That'd be rough to pull it off. Tell us about one. the DJ and the Synod. I want to run that. Oh, I didn't use the word dialogue, yep. so I kind of failed there. So a couple of weeks ago in one of our uh, Catholic Family News weekly news roundups, we reported this. I, I was aware, you know, you covered it. Others had mentioned it on social media. This so-called DJ priest who's, you know, sacrilegious and frankly just degenerate in what he's posted on TikTok and other places. Um, but he apparently, according this uh, Catholic news agency report, uh, says that he was contacted by the Vatican and it quotes him as saying as as much. To, part to help uh, conduct a survey for this current synod on synodality. The report says, in a video posted June 24th, this priest excitedly tells his viewers that, quote, it's Rome that called me, the Vatican, at the request of the Pope and the Secretary of State. The church needs you and wants you to do a survey, the priest continued, saying that the person who called him was Father Lucio Adrian Ruiz, Secretary of the Dicastery for Communication. So when and that's the same so one the that James Martin is a, who just yeah. is promoting the Senate and who got called by the Vatican to promote it is this guy right here. Let's go! He should be excommunicated. He should be I mean that is the synod. That's who they want to help with the synod. Yeah. That's crazy. So as far as this this new working document, it, as I said, it was released on October 27th at a press conference. And if you want to play those clips, we can. So thankfully, we had two, maybe more, but at least two very solid Catholic journalists there, Diane Montagna and Edward Penton, asking some real questions instead of just, you know, softball. Right. Uh, so they can spout their gobbledygook more and more actually some real questions and they didn't like 
getting those questions, as you will see from yes. this video. Okay, so I'm going to play the one that has Diane Montagna first. Yes. Okay, you ready to roll it? Here we go. Yep. Uh, Diane Montagna, the Catholic Herald. Um, a question for His Eminence, uh, Cardinal Grech. Uh, during your Frascati meeting, uh, from the, um, the social media platforms of si the Synod Secretariat, I'm thinking specifically of the Twitter account of synod at synod.va. There were several images put out uh, by the Synod Secretariat praised as works of art. Uh, not simply, these weren't simply um, objective statements, but positive praise for these works of art. Uh, Cartoon-like um, in their character, perhaps you remember them, uh, most of which um, represented ideas that would be contrary to the Catholic faith. Uh, one in particular made the rounds, a group of people in front of a church, one with a woman dressed in a chasuble as a priest, which of course is against the faith. Uh, another, I'm not sure if it was a male or a female, and I mean that sincerely, standing in the center <laughs> with an LGBT pride shirt. Uh, and these were praised as works of arts by the Synod Secretariat itself on social media. The Synod Secretariat, I think, as a consequence, lost a lot of credibility and trust in the eyes of many Catholics. That's not my judgment, I think. Normally, the Synod account does not get many replies. In this case, there were hundreds hundreds of responses to these images, mostly negative, probably, to be generous, 95% negative. Is the Synod Secretariat listening to these responses of um, the Catholic faithful? And how would you respond to them? We are listening to everybody. And um, if you go through the document, and now we are not only talking about images, but contents. Listening to everybody without excluding anybody, it is our responsibility to take note of all voices at this particular moment of the people of God. It is people of God. We cannot otherwise. Yep. We, you could also um, criticize us, no, that we are not a listening church. <laughs> yes, we, we could. are a listening church. No, you're not. At this moment, we are not taking any decision. Our duty at this moment is to be a channel to make the voices of the people of God that arrived through the Episcopal conferences. No? So in his mind, if it uh, came through the proper um, channels, please. that somehow legitimizes heresy. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is, is uh, so what? I mean, if a bunch of people submitted Aryan documents, why does the Catholic Church have to produce art or ratify any of that document? It doesn't make any, right. it doesn't make any Catholic sense whatsoever. It does not. And the key to understanding why, I mean, as much as we can understand, in the working documents, it says, let's see if I can find this quote real quick here. Uh, real quick while he's finding uh -huh. the quote. Yeah, this is an important topic and people need to know about it. And that's why I want to say right now, like this video, YouTube is not going to promote Matt Gaspers and Taylor Marshall talking about the synod on synodal synodality. The only way right. people are going to be made aware of this nonsense that's going on in the world is if you actually hit the like button, which is the thumbs up, or retweet yes. it, or share it on Facebook, and you have to uh, share it. You've got to be text somebody, tell them to join the live stream. Yeah, get in the live stream right now. Share this stuff because no one is talking about this. Your bishop is not talking about it. Your pastor is likely not talking about it. Um, this is a nightmare. I mean, look at the image on the screen right now. This is this is produced by the Vatican. We got a woman in a chasuble. We got uh, somebody with the uh, Pride T-shirt on. All this published. I mean, come on. People need and to know all this. of this is being pushed in the working document, as we'll see later. Exactly. So, so, so like, just because you hit the like button doesn't mean you like what we're talking about. It means you you want people to know about it. So, like it, share it, etc. Um, anyway, I just wanted to make that commercial right there, Matt. Did you find yes, your quote? Sure. Yes, I did. So, Cardinal Greg 
as you recall, was talking about, he thinks it's his job to listen to the people of God and just to represent the phrase they kept using during the press conference was represented back to the people. They're supposed to compile, like receive, seriously consider what they've received and then represent it back. So in the working or in the handbook, the official handbook for this synod released in October 2021, it says, quote, the heart of the synodal experience is listening to God, not through listening to scripture, not through listening to the magisterium, not through listening to sacred tradition, but through listening to one another. The heart of the synodal experience is listening to God through listening to one another. It does say inspired by the word of God, but when it comes to female ordination, unnatural vice, they're completely ignoring the word of God. And then it goes on to say, we listen to each other in order to better hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking in our world today. Since when do we hear the voice of the Holy Ghost by listening to the general public? And then they have the audacity to claim that this is not some sort of sociological experiment, that it's a Holy Spirit listening session, as one of the sycophants said about this. It's just unbelievable. It's outrageous. Yeah. So speaking of that graphic and the whole clear push for female ordination, that was the subject of Ed Penton's question, if you wanted to play that clip next. And then uh, as you're getting it, I'll just explain. For some reason, Cardinal Greg chose to answer in Italian, even though clearly he can speak English. But I have Diane Montagna uh, graciously did a translation and posted that on her Twitter feed so I can read what the Cardinal said in response. And I just I always like to take a moment to thank Diane Montagna for the hard work she does. I mean, she gets, yes. I mean, so much of the stuff that we talk about, Diane is, is translating, is breaking. Oh is yeah. She's in the trench. Yeah. I mean, she's over there. And, so. and you notice how long I was just going to also say, notice how long they let her speak. I know that someone that they didn't respect, they would not let them do that. So she has got some major respect in that room to be given the mic for that long. Yep. It's awesome. So thank you, Diane. And then we also thank Ed Penton, who's always also bringing us great information. And this next clip is Ed Penton's uh, question. So you'll hear the voice of Ed Penton now. Here we go. Edward Penton, National Catholic Register. A question for Cardinal Gregg. Uh, paragraph 64 and 91 um, seem to suggest uh, that there's already underway uh, a push or a move in the Synod Secretariat to move the needle towards accepting a female diaconate. And I just wondered, is that true? Or can you give any sort of clarification on that? It's paragraph 64 and 91. Before I read his response, just let me read paragraph 64 okay. uh, from the document so people know what's going on here. And this is in a section, um, let me go down here in my notes. So this appears in a section entitled Rethinking Women's Participation. And this is what paragraph 64 says, quote, after careful listening, many reports referring to the diocesan reports that were gathered by the Episcopal conferences and sent to Rome, many reports ask that the church continue its discernment in relation to a range of specific questions. And then it gives a list the active role of women in the governing structures of church bodies, the possibility of women with adequate training to preach in parish settings, uh, and a female diaconate. And it goes on to say, much greater diversity of opinion was expressed on the subject of priestly ordination for women, which some reports call for while others consider a closed issue, end quote. So they just represent this stuff back to the people of God without giving any correction whatsoever that these things they're talking about are not possible. They are contrary right. to divine natural law. Yep. Okay. So here's how, so, you, so here's I can read the you want me to read the translation. Well, do you of want the, me to play any more on Ed Penton or is that it? Oh yeah, you can you can go ahead. Uh, Edward Penton, yeah, National Catholic end of Register. His question, though, a right? question for Cardinal Greg. Uh, paragraph sixty-four yeah, and here. ninety-one. Um, seem to suggest uh, that there's already underway uh, a push or a move in the Synod Secretariat to move the needle towards accepting a female diaconate. And I just wondered, is that true? Or can you give any sort of clarification on that? 
It's paragraph 64 and 91. That's funny because Sam flipped through the book like they don't know where it is, even though they're the ones who made this document. So here he goes on in Italian with his answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can go ahead and read what he says. Okay. So what he's saying here in Italian, I'll read the English translation. There's no need, uh, meaning to read paragraphs 64 and 91, because we are not pushing any agenda. This was also said at the beginning. It was our responsibility to present again to the people of God. Wait, to give back they're not to pushing the any agenda, but they're pushing this image on the screen. Right, exactly. I mean, come on. We're not idiots. Right. Why do they right. lie to us? They think we're such idiots. They do. They this think is why everyone watching right now, you need to tell your family and friends, this is what's going on. This is for real. They're playing us. Exactly right. All right I'm sorry. Go ahead and read the, read the no, answer. And just, I don't think I've mentioned yet, Cardinal Mario Grec is the Secretary General of the Synod of Bishops. So he is like the stage manager for this show. Uh, he says, it was our responsibility to present again to the people of God, to give back to the people of God what was given, actually, and it says entrusted to us. Well, actually, what their job is as a bishop, a successor of the apostles, is to give to the people of God what Jesus Christ gave us, and sound doctrine and a holy example, not this heretical garbage. He goes on to say, our secretariat has no agenda. I remember once my, card my colleague, Cardinal Hollerick, who is the um, relator general for this, this current synod, which is like a liaison between the bishops um, and the, the office of the Synod of Bishops. So Cardinal Hollerick said, we have a blank sheet. There's nothing written on this blank sheet. Then I repeat, Cardinal Gregg goes on, our duty is to accompany the church until the time comes for the Synod of Bishops, the meeting of bishops in Rome. Then it's up to them. But pastors, if we are to carry out our mission well, we have to listen and listen, I repeat, without excluding anyone. End quote. So if a Satanist walks up and says, here's what I think the Catholic Church says, you can't exclude him, according to the synod documents here. Sure. Satan himself comes in, says, this is what I think we should do in the church. Can't exclude. Embrace right. everybody. What? This is a direct fallout from Vatican II. Yes. Nostra Aetate, Lumen Gentium. And that's very evident in this working document itself. So towards the end of the document, uh, well, first of all, throughout the document, we hear the phrase radical inclusion quoted several times. Uh, I'll give you just a brief example here. This is from... Uh, Paragraph 31 of the working document, the vision of a church capable of radical inclusion, shared belonging, and deep hospitality. There's those buzzwords, inclusion, belonging, hospitality, according to the teachings of Jesus, is at the heart of the synodal process. It was interesting they say the teachings of Jesus are at the heart of this because our Lord teaches that uh, narrow is the way to heaven and wide is the way to hell. But I don't see that in any of these documents. Um, so, you know, they, throughout the rest of the document, you see what radical inclusion entails, but the connection back to Vatican II, which they keep making over and over, and it's at the end of this working document, paragraph 101, uh, it says, quote, walking together as the people of God requires us to recognize the need for continual conversion. And what they don't mean conversion to Christ and his church. They mean a continual changing of ourselves, basically, to worldly standards like yes. that graphic shows. Exactly. It says uh, continual conversion, individual and communal. On the institutional and pastoral level, this conversion translates into an equally continuous reform of the church, its structures and style. And here's the money quote. In the wake of the drive for continuous aggiornamento, which means updating, bringing up to date in Italian, the precious legacy of the Second Vatican Council to which we are called to look as we celebrate its 60th anniversary. And speaking of that, the graphic for uh, the, the featured image for today's show features a Synod of Bishops meme 
uh, which let me, let me get it on the screen. Oh, there we go, man. Talk about DJ. I feel like a DJ today. I got so much mixing on the turntable <laughs> right now with all these graphics and videos. All right, here it is. I got the yellow meme up there, which is part of our, our show graphic. So it says at the top, Gaudet Mater Ecclesia, which means mother church rejoices, which is the name of the opening address of John the 23rd at second Vatican council, October 11th, 1962. And this is what Pope Francis said. I just want to say, Mother Church has been groaning since the 1960s. It's groaning. (laughs) It's like a, oh. Mm -hmm. So this is what Francis said during his speech in honor of the 60th anniversary of the council opening. He said, quote, Brothers, sisters, let us return to the pure springs of love of the council. Let us rediscover the passion of the council and renew it. Oh, boy. So that's clearly what this synod is about. It's perpetual Vatican II. It's Vatican II on repeat forever. It's not about the Most Holy Trinity. It's not about the Eucharistic sacrifice, going to confession, uh, preaching the gospel to uh, people who don't have faith, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh restoring the churches great works of of piety and of art that bring honor to god no it's about dialogue and i think the word that they the and word shutting that down all of your parishes yep shutting down seminaries because there's no young men who want to go and be uh, limp-wristed clerics standing you know shoulder to shoulder with you know grandma Rita handing out communion. So as I said in a, a Twitter thread a couple of weeks ago, maybe it was last week, essentially the Synod on Synodality, this three-year, or now four, I guess three-year thing, 2021, 2024, who knows, it might get extended again for all we know. Uh, the Synod on Synodality and Vatican II share the same root problem, and it's what I just read from the working document, the drive for continuous aggiornamento, which means updating and it, it's the false notion that the church must update herself remix herself whatever in order to please the modern world in order to supposedly become more appealing to modern man when every time they try to do that they actually become less appealing the numbers drop off you know dramatically because people can get the modern world in the world they don't come to the church in order to to get the modern world. They want the truth, the people who are serious about it. And that's this aggiornamento is essentially what enlarging enlarging the tent means, the theme of the synod. So just to give some historical, make some connections for folks between the council and the synod. So what did aggiornamento mean, this updating mean in the 60s? Well, to quote uh, Monsignor Annibale Bugnini, the destroyer of the Roman rite, or attempted to destroy it, thanks be to God, it's survived and thriving. But he said, in the pages of Lo Salvatore Romano, the official Vatican newspaper, May 19th, 1965, we must strip from our Catholic prayers and from the Catholic liturgy everything which can be the shadow of a stumbling block for our separated brethren, that is, for the Protestants. That is aggiornamento in the 1960s wrecking the liturgy in order to please, objectively speaking, heretics and schismatics. That's aggiornamento. Yep. Fast forward to today, and aggiornamento, clearly according to the Synod of Bishops, means those horrible things on that ridiculous graphic that they circulated on social media. The establishment of some sort of ordained ministry for women, which, by the way, is objectively impossible, as even the the new the post-conciliar catechism of the Catholic Church says in paragraph 50, or 1577, and the acceptance of unnatural vice, which is also impossible. And they should be saying these things. They shouldn't just represent this heretical garbage back to the people of God. They need to correct these errors. That's their duty. Um, so as I've said elsewhere, you know, the, the synod on synodality is basically meant to be in a, a perpetual extension of the council. But sadly, it's even pushing the ecclesial envelope even beyond 
the, the very problematic letter and spirit of Vatican II. And I can give some examples from the working document if you'd like. Yes. All right. So, uh, and I have a, a very detailed article about all of this coming out in the uh, December issue of Catholic Family News. So if you're not already subscribed, I encourage you to visit our website, catholicfamilynews.com and click on the new subscription tab on the home page and get information about how to sign up. Um, so I'll just give a couple examples from the working document about what aggiornamento means to them now. First of all, ecumenism and environmentalism. Oh boy. So we know, yeah, we know from the official preparatory document and handbook released uh, last October that ecumenism is integral to the current synod, just as it was for the council. So it's not surprising uh, that we find the following in the working document, quote, a synodal process is incomplete. So a Catholic synod is incomplete without meeting brothers and sisters from other confessions, sharing and dialogue with them and engaging in common actions. The reports from various Episcopal conferences express a desire for deeper ecumenical encounter and the need for formation to support this work. How is a Catholic synod incomplete without non-Catholics? Right. <laughs> it's it's crazy. And interestingly, in the doc in the working document, they they put together uh, ecumenism. They've paired it with social and environmental justice. In the document, it says this call for renewed ecumenism and interfaith engagement is particularly strong in regions marked by greater vulnerability to socio environmental damage and more pronounced inequalities. Uh, a further theme common to many reports is the weakness of deep ecumenical engagement and the desire to learn how to breathe new life into the ecumenical journey. <laughs> I'm not making this up. This is what the document says. Uh, starting with concrete daily collaboration on common concerns for social and environmental justice. I mean, this could have been written this by... This is all they the care World about. Forum. It's right. not about your soul being saved through Jesus and the sacraments, it's about working with other religions to bring about social transformation. Yep. I want to share oh, a here's... picture. I got a picture real quick I want to share. Uh, this is, um, I've shown it before, but people need to hear it. This is the Protestant ministers at Vatican II that were called there by Pope Paul VI to help rewrite the Mass, rewrite the liturgy, and make it more Protestant. Yes, you heard me correct. The Pope brought in one, two, three, four, five, six Protestant ministers to assist in wrecking our Holy Mass. From left to right, you have... These are all either clerics or scholars, Protestant. George, Jasper, Shepherd, Kunith, Smith. And then on the far right in the white robe is Max Thurian. He's a reformed uh, liturgical scholar, Protestant liturgical scholar. And there they are. And then on the far right in, is Pope Paul VI in the white cassock. So, who, by the way, referred to this aggiornamento in his first encyclical as the guiding principle of the council. Right. All of this aggiornamento stuff, the guiding principle. Yeah. Aggiornamento. It's like if you say buongiorno, that means good day. So aggiornamento is bringing everything up to date, up to this day. So we don't want Catholicism of Jesus and the 12 apostles. We want Catholicism that's like groovy and hip on the 1922 tip. I mean, the 2022 yep. tip, or more likely 1960 or 72. Somehow they got stuck in the 60s and 70s, yeah. So going back to the uh, the working document, some more examples of what aggiornamento looks like today, according to the Synod of Bishops, uh, we have a section that's devoted to the church needs to become a more welcoming space in light of the theme, enlarge the space of your tent. Um, the church needs to become a more welcoming space for all, including those 
whose quote-unquote loving relationships objectively violate divine and natural law. Here's what the document says, quote, the reports clearly show that many communities have already understood synodality as an invitation to listen to those who feel exiled from the church. Among those who ask for a more meaningful dialogue and a more welcoming space, we also find those who, for various reasons, feel a tension between belonging to the church and their own loving relationships, such as, here comes the list, remar remarried divorcees, single parents, people living in a polygamous marriage. That's a new one. <laughs> Mormons uh, are going to be psyched. Yep. <laughs> and Mohammedans. People living in a polygamous marriage, LGBTQ people, etc. And it goes on to say elsewhere, many summaries also give voice to the pain of not being able to access the sacraments experienced by re remarried divorcees and those who have entered into polygamous marriages. There is no unanimity on how to deal with these situations, which the document says. <laughs> uh, since apparently calling these people to repentance and amendment of life is out of the question, according to the Synod of Bishops. But if you have a attraction for the traditional Latin Mass, mm -hmm. you're not welcome. And that's I was uh, born. I, I was born that. this way, Matt. I was born loving the traditional Latin Mass. I can't help it. I was yep. born that way. It's an attraction. or It's an orientation that I have. I have an ad orientum orientation. <laughs> I just can't make it stop. I have an ad yep. orientum orientation. This is a good outtake. It is. We, it is. We suffer from ad orientum orientation. <laughs> and we need to be welcomed and accompanied. Yes, A-O-O. -O. Odd orient or more <laughs> That's what I have. I'm afflicted with it. Yep. Born that way. So we already talked about the whole uh, rethinking women's participation, so I won't rehash all of that. But they, clearly they're pushing for some form of ordained female ministry. They're talking about lay women preachers, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but we'll, maybe we can end on synodality and liturgy, because there is definitely... The, some speculation on my part, but I think it's well-founded. There is a definite connection between the synod on synodality and the effort to get rid of the traditional mass. And I'll explain. For sure. Um, so here's what it says. I'll just to give a little background first. And I mentioned this in my article in the December issue of Catholic Family News. So when Paul VI preemptively defended what he called repeatedly his new right of the mass. So anyone who says that he never called it a new right he did explicitly in November of 1969 in two different uh, general audience addresses. He couched his liturgical aggiornamento in terms of, quote, obedience to the council. Those, that's the language he used, which basically meant obedience to himself, since the acts of a general council only gain authority through papal ratification, and he was the pope who issued, issued the conciliar documents. So when he says... Well, I'm just being obedient to the council. He's saying I'm being obedient to myself. Um, so he says, and it seems to me that the uh, the synod on synodality is moving in a similar direction, uh, except that this time Francis will be able to claim that he's just implementing the will of the people of God at large. Bingo. And and here's the text from paragraph 91 of this document. You're, Quote, you're nailing it here. You're nailing it. Many reports strongly encourage the implementation of a synodal style of liturgical celebration. It's anybody's guess what that means. That means lots of people around the altar. Uh, that allows for the of active participation. Banners. Yeah. Yes. Yep. That allows for the active participation of all the faithful in welcoming all differences, valuing all ministries, and recognizing all charisms. The synodal listening of the churches records many issues to be addressed in this direction, from rethinking a liturgy too concentrated on the celebrant, to the modalities of active participation of the laity, to the access of women to ministerial roles. Now, it's in this section of the document that the traditional Latin Mass finds its only mention. It says in a, in a section entitled Managing Pensions, Renewal, and Reconciliation, 
um, it says it's, it's followed by a mention of quote knots of conflict related to quote the preconciliar rights, and it quotes from the the U.S. National Synthesis published by the USCCB in mid September, and this is what the the Synod's working document says, uh, number ninety two quote. The most common issue regarding the liturgy is the celebration of the preconciliar mass. The limited access to the 1962 missal was lamented, but ultimately it says immediately after, quote, the Eucharist sacrament of unity in love in sacrament of unity in love in Christ cannot become a reason for confrontation, ideology, rift, or division. So what's the translation of that? The traditional mass is causing division, and therefore it must be eliminated. Or in more diplomatic terms, all Catholics, quote, who are rooted in the previous form of celebration, as Francis said in his letter attached to Traditionis Custodis, must, quote, return in due time to the Roman rite promulgated by Paul VI and John Paul II. So return. long story short. Keyword return. Yeah. yeah I mean, We're returning. We're we have to return to the new thing? What? <laughs> yeah. So I definitely think that there is a direct link between the synod on synodality and the efforts to get rid of the old mass, just like Paul VI appealed to being obedient to the council, even though it was being obedient to his own will. Francis is going to do the same thing when it comes to the traditional mass. At the end of this synod, he's going to say, well, I'm just... I'm just uh, implementing the will of the people of God, and the majority of the people of God don't want the traditional mass because it's too divisive. So we got to get rid of it. Yep. Meanwhile, you could have Muslims who just outright in your face say, Jesus is not the Son of God. They're not yep. excluded. You can yep. have atheists who say, God does not exist. They're not excluded. You can have Jews come and say, Jesus is not the Messiah. He was a failed prophet. Which is what Ben Shapiro said. They're not excluded. The only people excluded are the ones who following the prophetic torch of Archbishop Lefebvre say, we just want to do things how we, how our grandparents did it, how we were raised doing it. Right. That's not acceptable to these people because... They want a new conciliar Vatican II religion with new sacraments, new canon law, new, 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 new rosaries, new devotions, new uh, altar tables from Ikea, uh, new everything, new ministries. Ultimately, I think it's just because they're in a, they're in a revolution against God and there's a lot of homosexuality, sodomy in the ranks of the clergy. And there you go. Did I just say that on YouTube? Is that allowed, Matt? Well, allowed or not, it's there. <laughs> it's so. there. All right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. So, so let's wrap this up. Uh, where is I'm going to put the graphic back on the screen of where the the synod is going so they've already extended it are they going to extend it again what's your take matt gaspers well it's interesting if you look on the the timeline that they've published in this working document so we're, we're currently in stage two which started this past october and it's going to continue through march of 2023 and then in june of 2023 the rome is supposed to publish the official working document for the actual meeting of bishops in rome for october 23 and then another meeting is going to happen in October 24. But then at the end of this timeline, it just has a, a gray arrow pointing and it has 2025 on it. And it says the church continues to implement her synodal dimension. So it, who knows what that right. means? I mean, that could be I, I could definitely see more continuous adjournamento going on there, maybe more synodal meetings. I mean, the other thing we have to keep in mind is that. Francis is getting older. His health is not the greatest, especially after that surgery he had, where I think a significant, what was it, portion of his colon or something for diverticulitis. I think that's what it was. I forget when he had that surgery, but I mean, he's not going to live forever. So we're going to have to see who is elected 
uh, after him and in what direction things might take. And I mean, we could easily have a conclave, I think, even before this, uh, before October 2024, when the final meeting of bishops is scheduled to take place. So who knows? I mean, we need to, we need to pray for a, we need to pray for a, at least a better successor of Francis, which humanly speaking let's is. Let's pray for a saint. Let's pray, yeah, let's exactly. pray for a orthodox, sacrificial, patriarchal pope. Amen. You know what? I, I think this whole synod of synodality, I mean, if they think it's guided by the Holy Spirit, James Martin said it was guided by the Holy Spirit. I don't have the tweet. Uh, available yeah, right now, but he said that. the sin of synodality is guided by the Holy Spirit, third person attorney. If that's true, to end it would be a sin. Think about that. Yeah. If the sin on synodality is guided by the Holy Spirit, why would you ever want to turn off that spirit of grace? Mm-hmm. It's got to go on forever based on their presuppositions. Their presupposition is this is the greatest thing. You know, we love this. This is just, we get to consult everyone on earth, non-Catholics, and we get to constantly revise to update what it means to be a Catholic. This is cancer. Right. This is cancer cells that have infiltrated their way into the bride of Christ, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and it's cancer. And I couldn't help but notice while you were talking and explaining the processes, Matt, mm-hmm. if we're saying the sin on sin is cancer, look at this chart. We got stage one, cancer stage two cancer stage three cancer and moving into stage four cancer that is very good insight i had not thought of that i mean it's there humanly speaking it is it is not going in a good direction not looking good it's no we need to pray we're moving into stage three cancer my friends yeah yeah uh what we need is to remove the cancer from the body. We must remove the tumor. This is why I plead and I beg the College of Cardinals. I know there are cardinals who watch this podcast. I know it. I'm pleading to you, cardinals, to begin the process described by St. Robert Bellarmine, Doctor of the Church, on how to bring about a trial, a process to question and hopefully lead the Pope to repent. But if he doesn't, to remove him who has fallen de facto from the papacy. Robert Bellarmine has it all spelled out in De Ecclesia. And we need the College of Cardinals to begin that process. Waiting for the man to die is delaying the inevitable because you just get another one. We need to begin the process of St. Robert Bellarmine. Remove the cancer before we get to stage four. Yep. Exactly right. All right. Well, we got to pray. Yes, we do. We got to pray that rosary every day. If you're not praying the rosary every day, you're not on the team. If you're not praying the rosary, you're not fighting the cancer. We got to pray the rosary. What else do we need to do, Matt? Find a traditional Latin mass, if at all possible. Uh, if you have to drive a little ways, that's unfortunately that's pretty much the norm for most people. But it's worth it. Uh, we got to be studying the. We got we got to be studying as as tedious as it is to go through this stuff. It's important for us to know. We need to know the nature of this cancer, and the only way to do that is to by keeping up on what's going on, but we also need to be studying the remedies for the cancer, which is the traditional Catholic faith, Yes, which is reading the Roman catechism, reading the Bible, reading the lives of the saints, um, all of that. We got to be nourishing ourselves. We try to include, we try to keep a balance in Catholic family news between reporting all of this unfortunate stuff, all of this garbage, all of this cancer with the remedies as well. We have articles on apologetics, on the lives of the saints, on um, you know other other spiritually nourishing content, so that you don't get discouraged, but that it encourages you to keep fighting the good fight of faith, as Saint Paul says. So we got to be doing all that stuff. Excellent. And making sure we're raising our families uh, accordingly. That's right. Our kids, 
need the traditional ways or it's going to die. Tradition in Latin, traditio, literally means handing things down, yep. transferring down knowledge. We must do it. It was broken in the 1960s and 70s. A lot of us didn't get that. If you were catechized in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even today, you didn't get the pure gospel. You didn't get the traditional Catholic teachings on morality, on doctrine. So you got to go and get a catechism, the Council of Trent, Baltimore Catechisms, Dewey Rames Bible. You got to read that whole Bible, pray your rosary every day, go to traditional Latin Mass, and practice the traditional faith and the traditional calendar and the traditional feasts and everything. That's what we got. And if I if I can read a, a verse or a passage, short passage from Scripture on that mm -hmm. point. Uh, interestingly, when in Mo, in the book of Deuteron Deuteronomy, which is like Moses's last speech yeah. to the people of Israel before he dies. He says, I'm sure everyone will recognize this, these first couple of verses. This is Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and with thy whole strength. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. Now next, he's talking specifically to the fathers, to the men of the community. He says, and thou shalt tell them to thy children, and thou shalt meditate upon them sitting in thy house and walking on thy journey, sleeping and rising. Notice he didn't say for an hour on the Sabbath. All the Not time. Not what he said. Notice also he didn't say, take your kids to church and drop them off at religious education for an hour a week and you're good to go. No. He says, Meditate upon them sitting in thy house and walking on thy journey, sleeping and rising, and thou shalt bind them as a sign on thy hand, and they shall be and shall move between thy eyes, and thou shalt write them in the entry and on the doors of thy house. We need family catechesis led by the Father. You're on fire, Matt. I love it. By the way, did you notice the three, the four places where Moses told them to put? the word of God on their doorways. Yep. So you need to have a crucifix over your front door. I don't care if you live in an apartment, a condo, uh, a duplex, a mega mansion, you need inside your house, you need a crucifix over your front door. And then where else did Moses tell them to put it? Between their eyes and yep. their forehead. He said to put it, to speak it to their kids on their lips. And the third place in their heart. And where do That's we right. do that? In the Holy Mass. Right. When they read the gospel, right. we make the cross. We don't just do this. It's you're putting the gospel in your mind, on your lips, and in your heart. It's very important. See, the liturgy teach the liturgy is teaching us something that Moses taught us in Deuteronomy. Yes. This is how rich the Bible is. This is why everybody needs to read the whole Bible, Genesis to the Apocalypse. And speaking thing. of that, I'm, I meant to mention I'm enjoying. Oh yeah, the book, enjoying the book. I'm not quite all the way through it yet, but I'm trying to read a little bit each day. And what I love about this, speaking of scripture, is that it's not sensationalizing it. It's simply putting it in the context of salvation history, who the Antichrist is, and what the end of days looks like. So thank you, very well done. I like how you have tabs in there too. And I did not ask Matt yeah. Gasper to do that, but thank you for plugging my new book, Antichrist and Apocalypse. I'm going to go ahead and say, I think it is the most, in the last 300 years, the most sober and careful commentary on the book of Revelation, on the Apocalypse. No, nothing. Lots of no, quotes. No, I love the quotes from the church fathers yeah, also. It's not, I'm not giving you fantastical freak you out stuff. I'm giving you line by line. What did the church fathers and the early church teach about the Antichrist and the Apocalypse and the beast and 666? It's not, it's legit. Yes, it's like the antithesis of the whole left behind nonsense. nonsense. Yes, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, that's what I'm going for. The opposite of left behind series. Good. Well, thanks for reading the book. If y'all want a copy of the book, you can get it at Catholic bookstores. You can order it on Amazon. It is a, a number one bestseller in several categories. And uh, last time I checked, it continues to be the number one Bible commentary book at Amazon. So it's doing great. Thanks to everybody who got a copy. If you want a signed copy, Go over to patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. Just signed, signed one this morning. So uh, if you want a signed copy, go to patreon.com and you can sign up for tier three. 
and you can get a copy. So thanks for thanks for plugging that, Matt. And we need to plug right now Catholic Family News. Matt it does amazing work with their wet, with writing at their website, um, the newspaper. It's fantastic. If you want to stay plugged in and know what's going on, especially the topics. I mean, you saw today how well read and versed Matt Gaspers is on these topics. If you want to stay up to date, of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, Catholic uh, Family News has a, a channel. What's the name of the channel again, Matt? Just Catholic yeah. Family News. You search for that on YouTube, you'll find it. Yep. And then, of course, you can sign up and um, and uh, get the the newspaper version. Yep. If you visit our website, catholicfamilynews.com, and click the new subscription tab, you'll find all the different options for subscribing. We have, as Taylor mentioned, we have a, a hard copy physical newspaper that we publish once a month. And then that full paper is also available in electronic format, the e-edition, as we call it. Um, and then we also have the YouTube channel. We do a weekly news roundup, which we post on YouTube and Rumble and also on our website. Kind of take a look at, you know, three or four major stories from the week, give some traditional Catholic commentary on them. Um, so, yeah, we highly appreciate, definitely appreciate all the support and uh, check us out, please. Awesome. Very good. All right, right. Make sure you're praying that rosary. And thanks to um, everybody who supports Catholic Family News, supports this channel over at Patreon, all the students over at New St. Thomas Institute. Thank you very much. And um, why don't we say Hail Mary at the end? Does that sound good? Yes. Sound right. good. Nomini Patris et Fidii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, Amen. thanks for watching. Make sure you do, if you came in late, do the like. As I yes. said, YouTube has no interest, it's owned by Google, has no interest in promoting uh, Matt Gaspers and Taylor Marshall talking about the Synod of Synodality as it relates to Vatican II. So the only way people are ever going to see this video is if you hit the like button. That says it's worth watching. And then you share it. You are my algorithm. So share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter, retweet it, etc. And then if you are new, please do subscribe and hit that subscribe button. Click the bell to be notified. Make sure your notifications are on. All right. Matt Gaspers, thank you so much, man. Thank you. Have a blessed Advent. All right. And remember, our Lord Jesus Christ is the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless and Godspeed. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this podcast, please click the like button, the thumbs up, and subscribe by clicking the subscribe button and clicking the bell for notifications. God bless. See you in future videos.